see which slide is being displayed when I am speaking. That's okay, then you cannot see the audience, but we will turn the computer. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Welcome, by the way. It's an honor and a pleasure. Likewise, thank you. All right. Hello, Blaine. DDA uh, said hello, Audrey. Aubrey. <laughs> hello, everybody. Hello. Wow, can you see? That's all right. Have to be careful with the cables. What am I doing? Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Come on. Uh oh. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're still here, you know. Yeah, Jan Henk, can you help us? Yes. I think I pulled the cable. Uh, Iets harder praten, man. Um, after me, uh, there was uh, Arjen Kamphuis that spoke. Yeah, Arjen, would you yeah. like to talk to Aubrey uh, in person so you can give oh, a Aubrey, sort of wrap up what you talked about? Hi, Aubrey. We met at Sync uh, uh, yes, yes. last year. I, I, I Couple I times. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. And you? I, uh, I'm, I'm all right. I did a little uh, rundown of the sort of general technology means a talk uh, on, on the basic technologies underlying transhumanism and I had some questions about sort of the sustainability of the whole program given some you know resource scarcity stuff and environmental things that we're running into so that's sort of the short of it. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll mail you the link to the slides. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Didier and uh, Boris, would you like to uh, give a short story about what you've talked about? Sure. Yeah. No problem. Can you see me over here? No. Yeah, you must go there. Uh, we have the camera on this side. You can go. Okay. Uh, Boris Sala is, uh, was the third speaker and will be in front of the camera right now. <laughs> Hello, Aubrey. Hi there. Well, it's an honor to meet you. Uh, I uh, was introduced uh, to you uh, once by Elf Temi. I don't, I don't know if you remember him, but he's an American. He's living in California. So, so yeah, well, perhaps uh, you meet a lot of people, but uh, but he was very enthusiastic about you. I saw your lectures, not live yet, but I will. And what I did is I uh, I'm a sports instructor, and I told uh, I told the people here about uh, my experiment. Uh, I'm kind of daredevil in that way. With C60, uh, C60 dissolved in olive oil. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know about the experiment. Okay, so uh, I told them uh, what my experience were, and I'm doing that with uh, with with uh, over 200 people now, uh, especially people who are into sports, and I see I see the results there. So they are better performing, have more energy, need need uh, less recovery time, that kind of stuff. So the the practical use. On human beings uh, of C60 dissolved in olive oil. Okay. Great. So that's my uh, that, that, that's my uh, that was my lecture. I'm very very anxious to see what you're saying. I saw a lot of you, and um, well, it, it's an honor to speak to you well, live now. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hearing this. Okie dokie. Thank you. And you've also talked about resveratrol. Yeah, sure. Uh, that, that's something. Uh, about, uh, I told about resveratrol, um, the telomerase activators like uh, cycloestrogenol, that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, I try to be very practical about uh, longevity life extension. I think. Alright, 
Yeah. So, thank you, Aubrey. Shouting another mistake. Yeah, I think it's a mistake. met so many times already that uh, I don't have to have anything to say anymore. <laughs> so, seriously, I was uh, speaking about uh, political and social consequences of a uh, longer life and so on. So, but uh, we were not speaking much about uh, all aspects related to uh, yeah, really uh, technical uh, and uh, scientific uh, possibilities. So maybe you can leave the political aspects uh, outside and more spe speak about what will be possible in a uh, close and uh, a further future. Yes, maybe I can share a few things about that. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you, Lydia. <coughs> <Thank you. laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> they want to be talking. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, we've had email comments about uh, what you would like to share, but I, I know you're not a, a transhuman, transhumanist, but I did ask you also about your opinion on transhumanism, so maybe you can uh, share your opinion about that later on in your presentation. Sure, actually, um, yes, well, yes, if I remember to do so. Maybe I can just say it now, actually, because otherwise I might forget. Oh, yes, please. Um, I think, really, the main thing I want to say about that is that I feel that the word transhumanism does more harm than good. I think that it scares people just because it's an ism. And I think that if we can emphasize not so much the differences between our thinking and other people's thinking, but instead the similarities, we will have much more impact. In particular, I like to emphasize that, for example, the work that we do is just medical research. It's just another strand of medical research. It's similar to what people do. Similarly, work on artificial intelligence is really just improving automation. That's all it is, right? And if we speak about it in those terms, then I think people are much more receptive, which is really important. I, I understand and I also agree that it's uh, more accepted to talk about health than to talk about more sci-fi sounding uh, words. Yeah, we've seen some of that today already in yeah. the, some of the discussions we had. Oh yeah? Yeah, so we have, we have a, a little bit of the experience. Um, I, 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 I apologize for this interruption. I'm just making some changes here so that I have uh, power for my laptop, which is because the, the um, uh, power outlet that I'm using is rather malfunctioning, but I'm making it work. All right, no worries. We've also, uh, I, I mentioned uh, earlier, today that uh, I saw your interview on the BBC. Yeah. And even though you're doing normal, uh, or not normal, but you are doing mainstream, uh, in a way, scientific research, uh, and evidence-based, yeah. you were not really taken seriously, in a way, on the BBC. Uh, do you agree? Well, um, first of all, I do not know exactly which interview you are talking about. I have done many interviews on the BBC and another um, British television, so... Could it have uh, been hard talk? Oh, okay. So that's quite recently. Yeah. No, I don't really agree. Oh, I sorry. think actually that interview was very positive. You do. The, um, the program, uh, the, the, the style of interviewing that Stephen Sacker, the interviewer, tends to do, mm -hmm. is always very like that. It's always very challenging, you know, very combative. Um, so that should not be considered to be a reflection about me or about our work. It's just the way he does things. And to be honest, I felt, and I think a lot of people felt, that um, he, uh, he did not um, in any way uh, um, uh, 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 um, you know, win the argument in any way. You know, he definitely let me show that what we are doing is actually very realistic, even though it sounds very, um, very surprising at first sight. Do you have a, I saw that you have sent some slides, so you have a yeah, presentation so, prepared? Yeah, let's do it. So, okay, let us work out how to do things now. So, 
If I understand you, there are not very many people left in the room, and most of the people already know my work pretty well. So probably I will go quite quickly through the introductory part of the talk. Right. Uh, the main thing I will do is spend a little time on some of the new data which I have in the second half of the presentation. Great. Because in fact will be more interesting to the people who are present and also for that matter to the other people who are no longer present. Yes, because they will uh, watch it later on on our YouTube uh, channel. Perfect. All right. So I do not want to take too long. I have to be finished in about half an hour from now. All right. So, uh, so let's, let's get going. Yonek, how can we find the slides? Can you help okay. us? Okay, I'll stop. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Oh yes, I see my face up there in the top right corner. Yes. Okay, so let's go. Um, so as all of you know, this is what we do. We are interested in postponing the diseases of old age, and we think that the way to do it is with preventative maintenance. Next slide, please. So this is the real starting point of our thinking. We want to understand why we have been so much less successful in postponing the diseases of old age than we have been in postponing other diseases that used to kill most people, even in the developed world, a hundred years ago. Next slide, please. This is what most people think the reason is. Most people think that the main problem with age-related diseases is that there are so many of them and that it's such a complicated thing to attack each of these things one at a time. And that is certainly a big challenge, but I think it's only the second biggest challenge. I think there's one reason why we have failed to postpone the disease of old age that's even bigger than that one. Next slide, please. And in order to explain it, I need to focus us on a, de a definition of aging. And this is my definition of aging. It's just like the aging of a simple machine, like a car or an aeroplane. If any machine with, that has moving parts is going to damage itself as time goes on, with, you know, just as a natural side effect of its normal operation. And we cannot stop that from happening. And the machines, any machine, is set up to tolerate a certain amount of damage, but eventually it's too much. So the machine stops working. The human body is just the same. Next slide, please. So that's what this means. Metabolism, that means everything the body does to keep us going from one day to the next, creates damage throughout life, even starting before we're born, and eventually, in late life, there is too much damage and we have disease and disability. Next slide, please. So the thing is, that's not the way that most people think about this problem. Most people think about the problems of health in this way that I'm showing here. They think of various types of disease, including infections and inherited diseases, and also the progressive chronic diseases of old age. And then they think that there's this separate thing called aging, which consists of these very much more nebulous phenomena, like loss of, loss of muscle mass, that's what sarcopenia is, or decline in function of the immune system. That's what most people think. Next slide, please. But this is the correct view. The columns are the same, but the big black lines are in a different place. But the real way to look at this, the biological correct view, is that column three and column four are both parts of aging, and the only difference is semantic, terminological. That the things in column three are the aspects of aging that we have given disease-like names to, which is no real difference at all. Next slide, please. So, the problem with getting that wrong is that people have been trying to attack the diseases of old age as if they were infections, in the same way that we would attack infections, by trying to uh, pound away at the symptoms, at the actual pathology, and to actually eliminate it in the body. And we can see by looking at our definition of aging that that's obviously never going to work because these diseases are being caused 
by a side effect of being alive. So obviously we can't do it. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Hello? And the next slide is at the moment not working. Yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Oh, that's good. Yeah. All right. All right. So, yeah. so I am not the first person to point this out. For more than a hundred years, actually, some people have been realizing this, and they have been saying we must intervene at an earlier stage in the chain of events. Well, and that, uh, I apologize for this announcement, it won't happen very often, that's because I'm in an airport. Okay. It'll be over in a second. <laughs> You're at an airport. Yeah. It's live. I am. All right. Thank you for choosing the Burbank Bob O'Leary Okay. All right. So, um, uh, yes, so the gerontology approach says, let's try to clean up the metabolism. Let's try to slow down the rate at which aging creates this damage in the first place. And that's a really good idea, in principle. But it has problems too. Next slide, please. This is the main problem. Just like pathology of aging, metabolism is incredibly complicated. And it's really not going to happen. This is it's just too difficult to manipulate the system, to tweak it, so that it doesn't do the thing we'd like it to do, the creation of damage, but yet it still does do everything we do need to do, keeping it alive. And that's why there has been really no success in putting this forward. Next slide, please. However, about 20 years ago, a big, big, big thing happened in the study of the biology of aging. People were able to find mutations in simple, short-lived organisms that were able to postpone aging a lot. And they did it by this approach, by cleaning up metabolism, by slowing down the creation of damage. But it wasn't really as, as wonderful a discovery as we might think. Next slide, please. This is why. First of all, the damage that's already in place, that's already been created before of the therapy is applied, is not removed by a approach like this. Secondly, the way that these mutations worked was by activating genetic pathways that have evolved to respond to, in, to, to environmental conditions. In particular, the, 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 there was one environmental condition that was really important for this, which is famine, lack of calories. And the, all, of the, all of the really effective mutations that have been found in any organism that postpone aging are activating the same pathways that are activated when uh, an animal is being starved. So that means that you know that we can we can never do more than what the the animal naturally does in response to stuff out of action. And the really unfortunate thing is this last point I'm showing here mm -hmm. that it seems that longer lived species like human beings will not be able to gain nearly so much from activating those pathways as short lived organisms can. Next slide, please. So the question then is, what do we do? I'm not saying that the approach of cleaning up metabolism is useless, but it certainly isn't good enough to be the whole of our approach. So I think what we need to do is to go back to the fact that the human body is a machine, and to look at what we already do successfully to extend the longevity of simple machines far beyond how they were designed. This is a car that's 100 years old, and it was only designed to last 10 or 15 years. So we should be able to learn something about how to develop medicine against aging by looking at what we already do with man-made machines. Next slide, please. And of course, this is what we do. Rather than trying to slow down the process where damage is created by the body, or the process whereby that damage creates the ill health of old age. Instead, we separate those two processes from each other 
by going in repairing the damage every so often so that it does not accumulate to the level that causes ill health. Next slide, please. And in practice, when we get down to the details, this is what that policy actually means. The first step in implementing any kind of damage repair approach is to describe what the damage is. And it turns out, unfortunately, that there are lots and lots and lots and lots of different types of damage. But then, the second step is to try to figure out how to classify that damage into the categories that can each be addressed. And it turns out that that works out well. So, 14 years ago, I realized that we could actually classify all of the types of damage that we know about into just seven major categories, which are shown here on the left-hand column. And this, this classification is really, really useful because within each category, we can define a particular type of therapy, a particular approach to repairing that damage or making it harmless, so that we make that, we, 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 we separate the process of damage creation from the process of pathology creation. And the longer we go on, the more confident we are getting that this really is a good classification. People have always said, well, you know, maybe there are other types of damage. So you need category number eight or number nine. But it's not happening. I have been challenging people to come up with these categories for a long time now, for more than 10 years, and I seem to be getting away with it. Next slide, please. So it's important to understand the relationship between damage and pathology. I can say, you know, in principle, the changes in the molecular and cellular structure of the body that happen throughout life must be the causes of the eventual ill health of old age. But it's much easier to understand that if we actually look at specific examples. And some of these examples are really simple. So, for example, one of my categories is the is what we call division of sex cells. Cells that get into a state where they divide when they're not supposed to. That's, you know, pretty much the definition of cancer. So this is a very simple one-to-one -one relationship. Next slide, please. But many of the many of the um, aspects of age-related ill health are much more complicated. There are many ways in which the heart can go wrong in old age, and they are caused by different types of damage. Atherosclerosis is caused by molecular waste products accumulated inside the cell. That's the purple one here, intracellular junk. Arteriosclerosis is caused by chemical changes to the lattice of proteins that holds our cells together, including the artery wall. And that's the bottom one, the pink one. There's something called amyloidosis, which causes the heart to be weaker in very old age, especially for people over 100, and that's an accumulation of waste products that are the cell, the blue one. And then finally, there's the problem of communication between the heart and the brain, which is necessary in order to have the heart continuing to beat. And that goes wrong in old age because of cell loss, the top one, the um, very top one. So cells in the heart called pacemaker cells do not maintain their number during age, and eventually they stop listening to the brain. Next slide, please. Now, in the brain, you have the same kind of problem. Alzheimer's disease is defined as the combination of a type of waste product inside cells, called tangles, and a type of waste product outside cells, called plugs. And we now know that there is also a lot of cell death, cell loss, in Alzheimer's disease. But the big thing I want to emphasize here is that all of this is well known and established. None of this is my speculation or indeed anybody else's speculation. It's known to be true. These links between damage and pathology are completely standard and well known. Next slide, please. Furthermore, it's also vital to understand that this applies equally to those aspects of ill health that we don't call diseases. Things like the loss of muscle or the gain of fat mass during aging or the decline in the immune system. All of those things can be linked very clearly to each of these types of damage accumulation throughout life. 
Next slide, please. Next slide, please. That's good. Okay. So, for the rest of my time, the next um, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to go through some of the projects that we're doing. Okay. So, I, I think most of you who are listening are familiar with the general principles of our work, which I have been summarizing so far, and so this may be the most interesting part of what I have to say. So, I'm going to, I'm going to go through the, the, the projects that we are currently doing, and I'm going to classify them according to the types of damage that Sam has built about. Right. Let's first talk about cell life. So we do very little in this area, and the reason we do very little is not because we don't think it's important, we think it's absolutely as important as all the others, but rather because so many other people are also working in this space. We are a very small foundation step, and we have only about $5 million per year, so we need to be making sure that we spend it to make as much difference as possible. And stem cell research doesn't really need us very much. But the one area where we, we realized that something was being neglected, and that is in the immune system. There's an organ called the thymus, which, which shrinks with age, and it's really important in creating a special part of the immune system called the naive T cells. So we are building a new thymus using a technique that has been developed for use with other organs, and we are supporting that project in a very prestigious institute in North Carolina, the USA, called the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine. The second category, division of test cells, in other words, cancer, as probably most of you know, we have an extremely complicated and ambitious approach to combating cancer. We hope that we won't need this approach. We hope that other things, especially immune therapies for cancer, will actually make this unnecessary, but we are not relying on that. So what we're going to do is control the ability of cancers to extend their telomere at the end of the chromosome. And this is not a new idea. This is something that people have been pursuing for, for a while. And in fact, uh, a, a, big, a, a very important company in aging, Geron, has clinical trials right now trying to do this. But our idea is to do it more thoroughly than what has been done before. There are two ways in which we need to do it more thoroughly. The first one is we must control both of the ways in which cancer cells extend their telomeres. Most cancers use an enzyme called telomerase, and that's the enzyme that Jerome is focusing on. It's very well understood and very well studied. But about 10 or 15 percent of cancers use a completely different method for extending their telomeres. It's called alternative lengthening of telomeres, ALC, and, hard, and we don't know anything about it really at this point. Hardly anything is known. So we are doing some very basic science at our research center in Mountain View, California, trying to understand that. The second difference between our approach and other approaches to control telomere length is that we recognize cancers are very good at changing how they respond to therapy. So they, in particular, are able to, to pretend not to be cancers. If you develop a therapy that says, okay, let's control telomere length in cancers, but not in other cells, then the cancer will figure out how to masquerade. I'm sorry about this announcement. Let's just, let's just hesitate for a second so that you can hear me. Not to be okay. We would also like to remind you not to accept any item or other package from an individual that you do not know. And do not accept any package if you are unaware of its contents. The terminal gate areas are limited to ticketed passengers only or those authorized adults escorting unaccompanied minors. Thank you. Very good. All right. So, yes. So, we are interested in avoiding this problem of cancers pretending not to be cancers by simply doing our therapy to all of our cells, to all the cells in the body, whether they are cancerous or not. And we recognize that that will have big side effects because some of our cells need to extend their telomeres. In particular, the stem cells of the rapidly renewing tissues like the blood or the lining of the gut. So we are working on stem cell therapies that will compensate for this side effect of our telomere control. In 
We'll wait for us in the same place as we're doing the finest work. We have a project on the gut. We have but this group that we're working with have a very new idea, a very new therapy for repopulating the stem cell compartment of the gut using circulating stem cells that are in the, in the bloodstream. In the blood, in the bone marrow, we have actually got a bit further and we have now finished a project which shows that we can do this. Next slide, please. So this is the result of the project. This is not published yet. And it probably doesn't look very impressive if you just look at the graph, but it's very impressive once you hear the story. So, it's possible to make mice that die because of their short telomeres. Normal mice don't because they have very long telomeres. But if you eliminate the, um, the, the, the gene that makes telomerase, the enzyme that extends telomeres, then they eventually, after you, after you breed them for a few generations, they get in trouble. And the red line here is a representation of that. It's the survival curve of mice that are dying because they don't have long enough telomeres. However, there is a problem in doing any experiments with the blood of mice like this. The problem is that they get problems in their blood, but they also get problems in their gut, so that they can't do, they don't have proper digestion, and they get those problems at the same time. So you can't kind of tell which problem you are fixing. But we found a group in Germany which, are, which has which have discovered a different mutation, a second mutation, that essentially delays the problem in the gut, so that they only get problems in their blood. And we use these mice for our experiment. So now, the green line here is what happens if you give a bone marrow transplant to those mice. They don't get problems in their blood anymore. They get problems in their gut eventually, so they are still not so long-lived as normal mice, but still they live considerably longer, as you can see. Now, they still get problems eventually in their gut, so only a little bit longer. But that's, that's okay, it's still enough to be able to ask the question we wanted to ask. And that question is, if we do a bone marrow transplant with bone marrow that does not have any telomerase, but still they, do, they have long telomeres, so they don't have a problem immediately, does it still work? And that's the black line that you can see. And as you can see, it works perfectly. The, uh, the life extension that you get from the, that bone marrow transplant is exactly as much as you get from the bone marrow transplant using normal blood, normal stem cells. So we're very happy about it. Next slide, please. We're also interested in getting rid of cells which we have too many of because they refuse to die. This turns out to be a very important aspect of the decline of the immune system. And the project we're doing at Berkeley in California is focused on elimination of those cells. We're also doing a project at the Buck Institute focused on eliminating other types of death resistant cells. Then the next problem we're working on is waste products inside cells. And we have a very ambitious technique here which involves finding bacteria that have enzymes that can break this down. We are interested in finding those enzymes and incorporating them into human cells. And we have two projects there. One of them at our research center in California, looking at macular degeneration, the main form of blindness in the elderly, in which the compound, the waste product that we need to remove is something called A2E. And secondly, we have a project in, in Texas, looking at atherosclerosis, the number one cause of death in the Western world, and there, we're looking at a different type of waste product called selling keto cholesterol, 7KC. That product has moved forward very nicely. Next slide, please. So this is the problem we're trying to solve. White blood cells go into the artery wall and they clean it up. They get rid of rubbish that has been stuck there. And they're very good at it. But unfortunately, there are some contaminants in that garbage which poison the white blood cell and turn them into this type of cell, bone cell, which is a white blood cell that can no longer process fatty, fatty deposits like cholesterol. Next slide, please. 
And this is what we have achieved. We found bacteria several years ago which are able to break down the, uh, the toxic molecule, which oxidized cholesterol, and we also found how they do it. We found the genes and enzymes that they use. The really hard part was to get those genes working in human cells, and that was what we were able to do. Nearly two years ago now, we published this paper showing it. Essentially what we are showing here is that if you have insanely high concentrations of the toxic molecule, then all the cells die anyway. But if you have more modest concentrations, more realistic concentrations, then cells which have our enzyme do really well. They survive better than cells that don't have the enzyme, or cells that have the wrong enzyme, or cells that have the correct enzyme, but not in the right part of the cell. So we are very happy about this, and we are trying to move this forward. Next slide, please. So we have three other areas, as I mentioned earlier, we have a total of seven. We are working on mitochondrial mutations at our research centre. We are working on the stiffening of the extracellular matrix, which causes high blood pressure in the elderly, among other things. And we have a collaboration there between Yale University and a group in the UK, in Cambridge. The group at Yale made a great breakthrough a couple of months ago in uh, developing a new way to create the molecular structure that we need to get rid of, and that will be really useful in creating antibodies and so on. And finally, we want to get rid of molecular waste products outside the cell. This is something that we all we are very familiar with in the case of Alzheimer's disease, because amyloid accumulates in the brain and forms female plaques. But it's also present in other aspects of aging. And we're looking on the heart, which appears to be affected by amyloid late in life, and we want to get rid of that amyloid. We have two approaches, one at Harvard looking at ways to create neutralizing antibodies, which means antibodies that protect the cells from the, from the amyloid, and another project in Texas looking at proteolytic antibodies, antibodies which don't only bind to the amyloid, they actually break it down. And both of those groups have, have generated really impressive results very recently. Next slide, please. This is what the Harvard group have done. Uh, on the right hand of the graph, the green and yellow bars show what normal, so normal viability cells. The red bar on the left shows what happens when you give those cells amyloid. They get very unhappy, half of them die. The blue bar shows what happens if you get them amyloid, but you also give them the antibody that the Harvard group has discovered. And as you can see, they're just as happy as if they didn't have the amyloid at all. So this is complete protection from amyloid, and we're very, very excited about it. Next slide, please. This is perhaps even more exciting, breaking down the amyloid. The protein that makes this amyloid in the heart is called transthyroidin. It's a very important protein. It transports a hormone called thyroid hormone around the body. And it, when it's working properly, it forms into what's called a tetramer. So four copies of the protein tied together in a particular way. The tetramer is not problematic. It does not form amyloid. But occasionally, copies of that protein get into the wrong shape so that they don't form the tetramer. And those proteins, those misfolded proteins, cause amyloid. So we want to break those, we want to break down those misfolded proteins without breaking down the tetramer. And that's what this shows. We found an antibody that completely leaves the tetramer alone. That's the blue dots that you can see. But it destroys the monomer, the red dot, very rapidly. So this seems to be a very good breakthrough. And this was actually published a couple of months ago in a highly prestigious journal. Next slide, please. We have a few other projects that are not tied to a specific strand of sense, any of the seven strands. We are interested in looking for other strands, even though we think they don't exist. I apologize for all of these announcements, but perhaps it makes the, the, the talk that much more unique. 
<laughs> anyway, yes, we have a project at Einstein College of Medicine in New York that is looking at whether we need to add another category. And it looks like we don't, but we'll see. We have a couple of other projects looking at other aspects of this whole field, looking at whether we can sidestep some sense, and also looking at how we can do gene therapy better. And then we have three projects which are not actual laboratory bench work at all, looking at how we can accelerate the development and also the dissemination of these therapies. Next slide, please. So, I wrote this book several years ago. It's still pretty up to date because all of the massive amount of progress that has happened over the past few years has been very much what we had predicted seven or eight years ago. And that is a, another really good sign that the sense paradigm, the sense philosophy, is standing the test of time. Okay, I'll stop there. If anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you, Robert. Uh, can we get back into the picture? Or, or can you see our video image at the moment? I can see you, yes. Oh, I didn't know that. All right. Yes, uh, is there anyone who wants to ask them? It was a pretty technical uh, presentation if we compare it to the more philosophical presentations we've had uh, earlier today. Uh, and we're, we're a Dutch audience, this was in English, but on the other hand we're all interest, interested in this topic. So, Absolutely. Does anybody have a question at the moment? Uh, which one of the interventions is uh, closest, nearest to a realization? Is, which one of the solutions you're talking about is uh, nearest to implementation at the moment? I would certainly say that stem cell therapies, the solution to cell loss, is closest to implementation. But I want to emphasize that because this is a divide and conquer strategy, that doesn't really matter very much. We need to get all of these things working reasonably well before we can expect to see any significant progress in post Okay, thank you. I have a question, because I, I saw you talk, or I heard you talk about telomerase, but then you were talking about uh, telomere length control and also uh, shortening telomeres. Uh, While well, in another talk, the talk by uh, Boris Sala, for instance, we talked about lengthening telomeres. Uh, I think that's about healthy cells, <coughs> lengthening telomeres. Um, did you talk about shortening telomeres of, of cancer cells? Because I did not completely understand. Was it pre preventing that? Yes, so this is very important. So, we, um, everyone knows that the control of telomere length in a trade-off, that most of our cells do not make telomerase, and the ones that do make very, very little of it. So we, are, we, need, we need to understand why that's true, and most people think that the reason that's true is because cancers need to divide so much in order to kill us that they need to turn on a, a way to extend their telomere. So if we turn telomerase down as much as we can get away with, then it makes it that much harder for cancer to grow and enough to kill us. Um, now, that means that we have two options. We can either say, well, okay, let's find some way to really, really cure cancer, and then we can be really liberal about telomerase. We can stimulate it so that other cells uh, have more of an opportunity to divide. Or we can go the other way, we can say, well, cancer is incredibly hard to fix. Let's use this one trick we have and let's make it work even better than evolution has made it work. We're going to create side effects. We're going to accelerate other aspects of aging, but maybe we can fix those other aspects in a different way. And that's what, that's the approach that we're taking. Okay. Now, it's not necessarily clear that that's what we need to do. Lots of controversies still exist around whether telomere thrift, you know, the, the low expression of telomerase that we see naturally, really is an anti-cancer defense. And I'm very pleased that other people are working on the other side of the, the, the coin. They're trying to figure out other ways to fix cancer. Search. But we want to be ready in case this is the only way that really works. Okay, thank you. Because at first it sounded a little counterintuitive to me, but I'm not a uh, specialist. <laughs> Uh, is 
He's, uh, he's walking to the camera at the moment. Hello, boy again. Um, so you always say that uh, there are these uh, seven causes of aging, and that if you don't find, if we don't find the solution for the seven causes, we will not really progress. So uh, logically, it would mean uh, it would mean that it, uh, it, it uh, following you, it will be impossible, for example, to have gene therapy and to gain uh, really. Uh, life expectancy just by changing our genes or I'm wrong or do you because no. uh, because my one of my big hopes is there I would say and you that, that, you that correct. Yeah. Okay, let, 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 let me take this one at a time and let me wait until the announcement has finished sorry about this Good. okay so yes so gene therapy is an essential component of what we need to do. Many of the aspects of sense will need to be implemented by changing our genome. But if we were to try to fix the whole problem of aging in that way, we would need to change a lot more genes. We would need to exploit the genetic differences that exist, for example, between mice and maybe mole rats. And there are two big problems there. The first problem is we don't know what to do because human beings are already really on this. We don't have any organisms to copy. And the second problem is we would have to change an incredible number of genes, maybe even half our genome, whereas the genetic modifications that are required by sense would only be like maybe a couple of dozen genes. Maybe 20 genes. Yeah. Okay, so the short answer is we would have to change too many genes, so it's impossible on the short term. But the thing is, with sense, we have to change or add maybe 20 genes and then just do a few other non-genetic changes and then we don't need to change any other genes. But can you not imagine that, you know, for, there are sometimes uh, very similar um, kind of animals, uh, like uh, there is one for chameleons, for example, when they have very different uh, life expectancies, so it could be, we could uh, think that it would be possible by changing not so many genes to have, uh, to yeah. have one. Uh, uh, but I know uh, what you, what uh, you uh, said, uh, that, that they are, uh, okay, that we, we live very long already, I know. Yeah. yeah, no, no, it's not just that. It's that that's not how evolution works. If you have a species and is exposed to selective pressure that makes it sensible to evolve slower aging and a longer lifespan, then it will do so quite quickly. But it will do so by changing a lot of genes all at the same time. Evolution works in this very crazy way because mutations are happening all the time in all of our genes. And so evolution does not need to try one gene at a time. It tries lots and lots of genes, all the same, lots and lots of changes all at the same time. And the result is, even after a couple of hundred generations, a small amount of time, you can have many genes that have made important contributions to the increased longevity. Okay, thank you. Aubrey, I still have uh, about the same uh, topic uh, question, because I think I've seen research uh, where they uh, genetically modify uh, mice, for instance, or other animals, and their lifespan increases uh, tremendously. Yeah. Why not with humans? Okay, so this is something that I discussed very briefly about 10 minutes into my talk. This is the, essentially the, the emulation, the copying of the famine response. When you take a mouse or a rat and you give it less food than it would like, then it goes longer. Like and great now, we can do the same thing genetically, but that's all we can do. If you look at all the results that people have got, in extending the longevity of mice or rats using genetic modifications or using drugs, they're all about the same, at most, as what you could have got in the 1930s from just starving the mice. So we're not beating that, we're just doing it in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, and how, how, what sort of a percentage of people would be does that give? 30%? Uh, yeah, so that's the other point. 
So in the case of mice or rats, we may be able to get maybe 40% increase, maybe 50%. Sounds great. Yeah. But unfortunately, in longer-lived species, we get a much smaller percentage. And indeed, in shorter-lived species, like worms, you get a much bigger percentage. You can get maybe three or four times the lifespan. Exactly. Just a So, and we understand that too. It, it's, it's what you would predict from evolution, that longer-lived species will get less because long famines are not so common, not so frequent as short famines, so there is not enough selective pressure to evolve the machinery. Okay. Um, right, guys, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go now. I have to get picked up and taken to the next lecture I have to give. But I'm very happy to have been able to do this. I'm glad that we were able to make it work. I apologize for the announcements that interrupted us, but maybe that makes it all the more special. So thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm glad you had a great day. I hope that Natasha will round off the day with another great talk. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Aubrey. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Thank you.